Welcome to the Vina Lichendi lecture series organized by the School of Governance, Law and Society of Tallinn University. I am Tony Sartz, head of the Evaluation Committee, Associate Professor of uh, Comparative Politics. And uh, today, today we will have altogether three lectures given by the candidates to the tenure track position in Professor of Social and Population Policy. And the first candidate is uh, Trine Lowry. And uh, please, Trine, the floor is yours. Uh, I give you 45 minutes for your lecture. And after that, we are going to have a questions and and, uh, and comments session, uh, the Q&A session. Thank you, Dennis. And uh, welcome everybody to my lecture. Thank you for participating. And really sorry that uh, we have to have that lecture uh, via Zoom. So <laughs> I think we all would uh, enjoy, would have enjoyed the lecture in a traditional format much more, but I will give my best. Okay, give me a second. I will share my screen. Here we go. Do you see it now? Yes. You do. Okay, let's go. Uh, my lecture is going to be about education and uh, welfare state and I claim that this is an uneasy uh, relationship question mark however <laughs> I claim that this is an important one um, let's start with this claim that of course education is crucial uh, and I don't know whether in almost in everything from from our attitudes to earnings to growth and there are scholars who claim actually this is uh, uh, regrettably neglected or understudied by political scientists and scientists and especially by by comparative uh, policy analysts or or comparative political scientists, especially when you compare, uh, compare uh, this um, attention what has been given by sociologists, for instance, or economists. So, however, all, all claim that education is crucial and my lecture is explain or try to explain why I consider it important as well and why I consider it to be important to, to be taken on board by comparative political scientists as well. Uh, so and during my journey with this lecture I claim that this uh, kind of decades of neglect of education in political science it's going to be one of the central cleavages actually and this is why we need to understand it better also as political scientists together with all other uh, related disciplines uh, because we have to understand the causes and the consequences of educational inequality so what i'm going to do with my lecture i am going to give you an overview uh, how uh, literature, literature has been uh, conceptualized the link between welfare state and education or the link between social policy and education education uh, and i will end with um, with overview of uh, public acceptability of modern welfare state which is very much education centered actually and of course, in, in explaining uh, this literature, I will try to bring in my own contribution in this field as well as much as possible. And I also try to track time. So I hope to be get it done within 40 minutes. So let's start with the most uh, famous 
uh, scholar uh, in the literature of welfare states and social policy. It's, of course, uh, uh, Esping Anderson, Josta Esping Anderson, and his three worlds of welfare capitalism. And as I assume most of you uh, here, listeners and committee members, you are aware of Esping Anderson. So I'm not going to be, I'm not going to um, go into the uh, many details of that model. However, I want to highlight a couple of aspects and especially the aspect whether Esping Anderson uh, approaches education at all. And actually, the short answer is no. <laughs> so, and very briefly, how Esping Anderson uh, conceptualizes uh, welfare states and social policies, uh, he's very much uh, focusing on uh, redistribution. So the, so, the role of social policy is to redistribute. And furthermore, it has very strong vertical redistributive element in it. And of course, we have to be aware uh, when this model was proposed, it was three decades ago, so which means that it was heavily dependent on old social risks, which means that uh, main social risks we had at that time were uh, related to our labor market activities or not even our but male labor market activities though and the only risk you have to uh, be aware of was uh, those ones which kept you out of labor market so basically it was politics against markets so when markets fail, then welfare state comes in and will help you out. So this model was very much gendered in that regard that it only uh, included men and, and all others, the children and females were uh, protected uh, via male breadwinner. And of course, uh, we cannot to, blame that model because it was uh, emblematic of that time. So, and as I said already, education was excluded. Education was not at all approached by Esping Anderson. Why? Because it was old social risks dependent. It was uh, cash benefit dependent model. So, and, um, and uh, basically, uh, this model uh, distinguished uh, three types of welfare countries or welfare policies, uh, social democratic, conservative and liberal, and these differences in kind, which means that qualitative differences in countries design of social policies were um, uh, described via three main or the balance between three main spheres of um, countries market and family so in liberal countries the market uh, dominance uh, was most pronounced or is most pronounced the state of dominance most pronounced in social democratic uh, uh, countries and and in conservative countries uh, this family dominance was uh, most pronounced. And these two key dimensions which uh, brought us that uh, three-way <laughs> division between country social policies, uh, these key dimensions uh, which uh, gave us or which operationalized these differences uh, across countries was or were the de decommodification and uh, stratification. And as I said already, this uh, Esping Anderson's model was very much uh, cash benefit dependent. It didn't include uh, benefits in kind, which mainly means services, including education. However, educational scientists wouldn't or they would hate they would hate if I say education is service but anyway <laughs> they didn't they didn't include uh, education they didn't include any services they only included uh, uh, benefits in cash which was very much 
justified because this uh, Esping Anderson's models uh, was centered on so-called old social risks such as old age, such as sickness and such as unemployment. Uh, the other important dimension uh, besides the Tingo modification was stratification, which basically gave us the answer whether social policy in country itself stratifies. So, for instance, whether different countries have uh, uh, different eligibility rules uh, to get access to social policy, uh, dependent on whether you work or dependent on whether you are in public sector or private sector, whether it's universal, whether it's means tested, so on and so forth. However, education, as already Bilensky said, was very special. It doesn't redistribute, at least not as much vertically. And it's very special because it takes longer perspective. However, it's not that special if we compare it to social policy uh, because it also very much deals with social risks and it pe prepares people to, uh, be, to be better prepared to mitigate with uh, social risk during life's life course. And of course, I do not want to blame this Esping Andersen's model itself. It was like, a, it was a huge uh, development at that time. It was very good systematic uh, understanding, uh, uh, theoretical conceptualization of differences in social policies in different countries. And, and I even didn't, I do not want to blame Esping Andersen that he didn't include education. However, the problem has been the popularity of that model and the popularity of that model in analyzing uh, social policy also in contemporary era. And um, of course, uh, um, today's social policy and in, in, in today's, let's say, paradigm, we very much acknowledge that we have to reconceptualize our under basic understanding or our main understanding of contemporary social risks. And we talk about this shift from old social policies to new social policies or from old social risks to new social risks and the welfare state literature, literature it very much uh, uh, leaning us toward or it's very much notches <laughs> us toward the, the uh, importance of investment or the importance of those type of policies which also invest in people which prepare people means education <laughs> and other policies as well, like family policies and active labor market policies, in addition to or as complementary to compensative and so-called cash dependent or compensatory policies. So, um, and what happens when we try to apply the same Esping Andersen's very famous model in education? Of course, there have been many scholars who have tried to do that. We borrow those, these same two key dimensions, decommodification and, and uh, stratification, and try to operationalize these same dimensions in the field of education. And there are many who have done that. And of course, yes, we can admit based on that literature uh, that uh, we have different regimes of education as well. And when we do that, we usually uh, you, to operationalize the commodification or decommodification axis, we use the uh, measurement of the private provision in education. In other words, what is the share of private providers in education? And if you look at the scatter plot uh, in the left hand side of, of my slides, you see that this, uh, this is taken from Kusemeyer's book, Skills and Inequality, and the higher the country 
uh, is positioned on the y-axis, the, the higher the share of private providers. So the more commodified is education policy. And the other x-axis gives us the uh, indica indication about education stratification. So the more right-leaning countries are, the more stratified. Uh, in other words, the more dependent uh, on family background are the educational access or educational outcome. Okay, we, we, are, we, we are aware of that uh, opportunity now, so we know that we can apply the same famous Esping Anderson model uh, in education. However, uh, uh, many scholars have claimed, me included, Pusemeyer's included, that actually this is too broad and it doesn't give us a good uh, answer uh, what exactly is behind that educational inequality because uh, very commodified education system actually, or okay, let's not say very commodified, but commodification in education not necessarily mean always educational stratification, so it's too broad. Uh, uh, also, it doesn't say anything about skills, it doesn't say anything about interplay uh, between education policy and social policy. So, yes, it's doable, <laughs> and very many students do that, they want to I don't know, defend bachelor studies and master studies where they <laughs> try to play around with those models. But I think, uh, according to my understanding, in explaining the uh, role of education in, in um, causing uh, cleavages in society, it's, it's not, it doesn't have very strong explanatory power. So we have to dig deeper and we have to uh, move on. Uh, as I said earlier, we have seen some paradigmatic shift in, in comparative social policy literature and in comparative education literature as well, which claims that we have to reconceptualize re the understanding of social risks. And we are very often talking about new social risks and, and policies which are arguably better equipped to cope with those new type of social risks are very often called social investment policies. And I will have many slides about the social investment policies later, later on as well. However, many educational sociologists actually have claimed that um, this uh, shift from compensatory policies to investment-oriented policies uh, is, uh, has some dangers as well, and we have to be aware of those dangers. So um, then the easiest and starting question here is whether higher expenditures in social policy or in social policies always mean also higher expenditures in education policies. In other words, whether we see some complementary, uh, beautiful complementary relationship here, or whether it's a rather trade-off. For instance, those countries who do not want to or have decided politically not to uh, expend so much, not to spend so much in uh, social policies in general, whether they claim that actually education is our social policy. And very often liberal countries actually do that. And if we look at those scatters, yeah, the same data, just, uh, just uh, one has uh, confidence intervals uh, on it, uh, another not. So let's look at the left side uh, panel of my slide and the scatter plot. So you see that actually, yes, there is some sort of positive relationship between social policy expenditures and education policy expenditures based on 2015 data and its government expenditure or public expenditures. Uh, and for instance, if you look at the right up upper right corner uh, of that slide where we see countries like Finland, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, yes, they indeed 
put lots of money and effort to both uh, spheres, social policy in general and education policy. And at the same time, if you look at the country's uh, lower right corner, Iceland, Cyprus, uh, these are the countries which put much more in education and, and uh, very scarcely to social policy. And then Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, 40 countries you will see here in the lower uh, left corner. Yeah. So uh, based on these very general, very broad slides, it's really hard to say, say actually whether we see complementary relationship or trade off between those two. Um, dimensions, general social policy expenditures and education policy expenditures. However, uh, we see that this group of countries, uh, which are upper right corner, Nordic countries, actually they invest in both. So in those countries, this re re relationship, uh, assumingly, is complementary. And we have a one uh, sociologist, sociologist Heike Solga, actually, who has argued that wealthier states, they have double liability. They have to do both. They have to invest in education and they have to invest in e equality. And if you use, uh, if we use the same data, so we have the again or still the same two two dimensional and you will see along my lectures that I like like this two dimensional uh, conceptualization very much. So when we have again this two dimensions of uh, social policy expenditures and education policy expenditures actually will get like two. Uh, you'll get four uh, different clusters of countries. Of course, it's very much dependent where you put exactly those thresholds. Uh, but the bottom line or the main message from that from this slide is that we have countries who actually very scarcely or, or very <laughs> put very little money or expend little in both. Then we have those countries upper left corner who put lots of money into social policy but less into education and then we have those ones upper uh, lower right corner where, where where it is the other way around so they will put more education less uh, um, less social policy and then we have those countries where <laughs> where we have one and one, which means that they uh, spend heavily or they spend uh, nicely, <laughs> generously into uh, social policy in general and also in in in, in education. And and uh, actually, this double liability literature uh, or this uh, strand of literature claims that we, from the perspective of educational inequality and from the perspective of broader social inequality we have to do to be able to mitigate the problem of social inequality we have to do both so we have to put money both into broader social policy to to uh, yeah, to do improve the situation of uh, wider situation of social inequality and also to the education. And actu actually, the most intriguing point uh, from that literature is that the role of education as a potential equalizer has been uh, overestimated. And this combination where social inequality is high and you yeah, and countries will not put money into social policies, but at the same time invest in uh, quite nicely into education, it is the most dangerous from the perspective of social inequality. Because actually, if this, uh, the overall situation is uh, unequal, then even if you spend into education, but in case the access is very much dependent on family background or or is not universal, then there are not 
the disadvantaged one or disadvantaged, fam dis dis disadvantaged families, sorry, <laughs> they will not benefit uh, from those additional dollars or euros put into the education. So let's move on. What I have done uh, in researching educational inequalities. So this is where I started when I was preparing my doctoral studies um, and my doctoral studies were about um, school choice uh, and uh, school choice in Estonia in general, but in, in Tallinn in, in particular. And uh, we had a survey in, oh, sorry, my, my Zoom says that some mu music is playing, but is everything is all right. All right, you hear me? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, uh, and one of my studies, uh, when we analyzed um, uh, the effect, uh, family background effect in getting accepted by so-called elite schools in Tallinn and those ones not very familiar with Estonian school systems. That's just very briefly that we have some weird uh, division between open enrollment schools and neighborhood schools. However, all these schools are uh, publicly funded, uh, public, public schools, but some of them are more elite than others. And these elite schools or so-called elite schools, these are very very competitive in terms of access. And, and we had a survey in 2012, and based on that survey, we, sh we showed that actually this uh, access to those uh, elite schools is very much dependent on preparation. So whether you attended this preparation uh, courses, which are very costly actually, two times per week, six, uh, the kinder, kindergarten age children go to those like weekly. Uh, then whether you live in city center and also uh, moderately by mother's uh, educational background. Uh, so bottom line here is that even in the Estonian education system, we're actually uh, in international comparison comparisons we our situation is quite good from the perspective of educational result performance and also from the perspective of educational equity however we have some sort of weird inequality reinforcing mechanism uh, mechanisms taking place in the city center then i did another analysis where we compared uh, european countries uh, and choice policies in uh, european countries in those analyses i used uh, qualitative comparative analysis as method which is um, set theoretic uh, mm, method uh, uh, to compare or very, very often applied for macro comparisons. And our aim was to uh, analyze whether choice is always, whether choice is always, uh, uh, whether choice policies always cause inequality. And our outcome measure was education where we took into account both educational efficiency, performance, and educational equity, which means that whether all children, uh, regardless of their family background, get access to good schools. Uh, and, and then we uh, analyzed comparatively whether there are some choice designs where this is doable. And these uh, Venn diagrams are visualizing these uh, two routes, which uh, which uh, which you see in Sweden, uh, Denmark, Netherlands, or uh, uh, which yeah, which <laughs> let's let's say it simply. So it's uh, these types of choice policies or these configurations of choice policies are good at um, at uh, showing good results in both educational efficiency and educational equity. I have done also uh, educational inequality research together with sociologists in our university where we have analyzed the intergenerational transmission uh, of higher education. Uh, again, I used set theoretic methods here, so we were very much interested to see 
to what extent parental resources overlap. And most of you obvious or assumingly is aware that regressions are not very good at uh, uh, analyzing uh, accumulation. So regressions are very much more eager to analyze independent effects, but in the stratification research, on the contrary, you are very much to you are very much interested to see to what extent different aspects overlap, and this is what we did together with uh, Professor Elosar, where we were using PIAC data. Uh, and also in Estonia, when you are analyzing educational inequality, you always have to, not have to, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, one of the obvious results is that you will face ethnic educational inequality as well, because in Estonia, even if we have a very good result uh, in, in international, international comparison, in PISA, for instance, uh, but at the same time, we have a, a relatively remar remarkable um, ethnic educational gap, which means that in our education system, we have uh, uh, Estos Estonian language schools and Russian language schools running in parallel. And even if we have had many reforms or so at least some attempts to reform those systems, still this educational gap ethnic educational gap persists and we have been uh, we have been analyzing this uh, ethnic educational gap uh, based on PISA data but also based on ISS uh, uh, I, ICCS data which is uh, comparative international comparative data by database which has data about uh, civic and citizenship education so just i have to move on otherwise we are running out of time okay what uh, what other conceptualizations we are aware of when we are talking about comparative social policies uh, in addition to esping anderson's three worlds of welfare capitalism uh, another very famous model is varieties of capitalism uh, and this model puts actually skills and education at the very center of explaining variation in in across countries. Remember, Esping Anderson excluded education uh, because uh, education is very special compared to those social policies and social risks he was uh, centering on in, in his model. In a varieties of capitalism model, actually skills are at the very center and, and another good aspect of that model is that uh, it frames the um, political evolution of skill systems and education systems not as a result of isolated uh, government decision, but it's, uh, it's um, uh, inextricably fused to a broader, country's broader economic and social environment and based on that model we have two types of uh, two types of um, skill regimes or uh, two types of capitalisms one is liberal market economies which is more oriented on on general skills and the second is coordinated market economy which is more oriented toward uh, specific skills and uh, these authors show with that model how these decisions or how these coordination mechanisms incentivize specific skills and specific policies. So in other words, skill regimes and social policies are complementary, explicitly complementary in, in that model. And of course, uh, since uh, 2001, when this varieties of capitalism model were introduced, we have seen many, very many developments in very many fields where people try to apply the same logic in uh, political economy, in human capital regimes, but also in use 
youth transitions regimes or so-called youth citizenship regimes. And me, together with Anudot, we have also applied this youth, youth regime or youth citizenship regime in analyzing school to work transitions in, in different countries um, uh, in our project called Youngian which is a uh, right side uh, corner. Again, sorry, I have to rush a little bit because I have to track time. So, uh, but again, even if the varieties of capitalism makes a huge leap toward, uh, toward accepting uh, education and skills as very important aspect in, in analyzing our social risk and social policies and the developments of social policies. Uh, however, it's still, um, uh, it doesn't leave uh, much room for conceptualizing change. So, because it really concentrates on these positive feedback loops, which incentivize <laughs> certain certain type or certain types of regimes. However, we do not get. Uh, understanding, uh, or it's it's not so easy to understand how how we will see change. <laughs> what is it, what it what would be the way uh, forward from here? Uh, it also undermines diversity, but of course it's uh, you, it's always a problem with models. So that's why that's why we have models, and 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 I I, I think it's even more important is that it's really. Uh, historical in that sense that it's still very much dependent on on um, production regimes and perhaps it's not acknowledging yet or or many of these uh, many many much of this literature doesn't acknowledge the transformative pre pressure uh, pressure coming from the post industrialization and knowledge economy so, and the question is uh, how to concept conceptualize the education welfare nexus, ne education welfare nexus of post-industrial era, which address um, intuition that economic growth in knowledge economies uh, will require higher levels and new forms of investment uh, also in in social policies and there uh, is also another relatively rich literature about social investment both policies and politics of social investment which takes those um, arguments seriously and here the right panel or right side of my slide shows um, one two-dimensional two two-dimensional graph where Bruno Pallier, Celia Hoyserman and many others have conceptualized the um, have conceptualized the opportunities how to move on from here and these two dimensions are old social policies and those are these are those policies which deals deal with uh, old social risks and then the other axis is new social policies which deal with new social risks and of course uh, uh, different countries uh, have to make hard choices uh, in both or across both these um, dimensions and and why social investment is important uh, it takes first of all it acknowledges new social risks it uh, takes life course perspective in analyzing uh, social risks and and of course it emphasizes the importance to uh, invest instead in not instead of but in addition to compensate compensate compensative or compensation uh, investment in, in, in addition to uh, compensation. However, what is the problem of this social investment policy? So, so the good news is that social investment paradigm, it takes education seriously. It takes education really seriously on board and argues that we have to invest. We have to have more education policies. We have to have more family policies, uh, so on and so forth. However, 
most of these policies and most of the effects of those policies are very much dependent on historical legacies. So what is going to be the effect of social investment policies is very much dependent on what is the uh, playground. So how how equal or how unequal unequal is the uh, existing situation or what is the uh, existing legacy of existing policies. Uh, again, I have to move on here. I have a couple of slides here where we define social investment policies uh, and it's a very tricky task because there are lots of discussions how to define it properly. However, here we I, I take on board this WOPSI projects uh, uh, conceptualization where I focus on social investment policy goals and social investment policy functions, which is to create, preserve and mobilize human capital and, and these policy areas where we see it most is education, family policy and labor market policy, which all are areas I also personally have done research together with my colleagues. And of course, uh, as I said already in previous, uh, when I was talking about previous slides, education has been taken seriously here. Investment is one of the emblematic aspects of social investment policies. However, it's very much dependent on, on the uh, legacies of countries, whether this uh, social in most investment policy is going to be inclusive or stratifying. In other words, in other words, social investment policy, even if, if it takes education on board and even if it acknowledges the new type of social risks, it ha it may it might might cause problems in itself. Um, so the mid conclusion here is that education education is crucial, but <laughs> there is a growing criticism against some of the uh, some of the expectations of, of education and social investment policies because uh, very often uh, these policies have massive effects. So these are this distributional profile of those policies are very dependent on on uh, education or the level of education of beneficiaries. Also, there is very complex relationship between social and education policies, especially so because education policy is very much dependent on family background effect and also in, in enacting policies and especially social investment policies, countries' legacies very much matter. And, and, and then there we are going to get layered legacies of inequality uh, where old cleavages uh, uh, will, 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 are going to be intertwined with um, new cleavages. And that's why we need, um, and here comes the politics or political science, so we need politics of change uh, to be able to fully understand the complex dynamic of policy and 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 also the role and patterns of popular support and in this um, in this literature um, politics of social policy and politics of social investment policies and politics of education i'm really new uh, i started with uh, that literature and with those analyses uh, with my um, WOPSI project or with my involvement in project project, WOPSI project, uh, uh, I think two years ago, and also my doctoral, postdoctoral project is about politics of uh, skills regimes. So I have a couple of publications already in, in that field where I show Baltic countries' legacies and ethnic cleavages uh, still being the dominant cleavage. However, we see the educational cleavage to emerge. Uh, but I think I have been running out of time, so I will uh, just uh, show you a couple of my uh, work here uh, in the field of politics of education and in the politics of social policy, or my own contribution here, and then I will conclude. So, uh, as said, uh, to be able to conceptualize change, we have to understand the public 
acceptability of a modern welfare state and including education. Uh, in, and usually in this literature, we have seen this anal analysis to rely on two dimensional space. This one dimension is economic dimension, so it's uh, mainly centered on distributional conflict, conflict and the other dimension is um, ideology or so-called cultural conflict. And if we analyze Estonian uh, parties and party manifestos, what you see here on that slide, then this x-axis from minus two to eight shows you the division of Estonian parties across uh, economic dimensions from left wing to right wing. And one important message here is that you will see extremely right leaning political landscape here. So it doesn't mean that we do not have the demand for left side policies, but it means that uh, we do not have political supply, which uh, or we do not have left leaning political supply. And the other axis, which is operationalized uh, across cult cultural di division, um, uh, where upper side is uh, globalization, cosmo cosmopolitization. So it's more like uh, how open you are to European Union and 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 so on and so forth. And uh, the bottom minus means uh, how close you are. And in Baltic countries and in Estonia, in Latvia in particular, this axis is very much driven by nationalism course, discourse. And it's still, it's still as is, if you compare this 2011, uh, 2015 uh, manifestos, you'll see that it's even growingly important and growingly dominant because Mm, you see that our mainstream parties, such as Reform Party, for instance, ER, uh, is, is leaning toward uh, more closeness. So, and the main message here uh, is that when we want to conceptualize chains and when we want to know uh, what are the feasible strategies for social policies and what are the feasible strategies for education policies in our countries, we have to be aware of those uh, cleavages, these old cleavages, but also the, the, the ones which are emerging. So I will skip many of my own contribution here and to conclude. So <laughs> education is crucial, but sometimes itself a troublemaker. And it is important to analyze um, social and education policies together um, to address adequately or to respond to the changed or transformed nature of social risks. Uh, education is central to the world, world's most profound social challenges, whether it be educational inequalities, Matthew effect, uh, cleavages in politics, and, and therefore we have to understand those patterns when we, when we want to analyze change and feasible fu future trajectories. And I think this, uh, uh, this all need interdisciplinary contribution from sociologists who are best at explaining mechanisms of inequality, social work uh, who, who are perhaps, uh, best at, at involving street level, the role of street level bureaucrats in, in uh, acting policies and political scientists, of course, and population studies and demographers. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And now it's time for for questions and comments. First, I give word to the experts. So, Stephen and Corey, maybe you have something to ask or comment on. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation. I have just, I don't know if I have questions, but I was just something I found very very interesting is that in your very first slides you show this scatter plot having these uh, uh, countries based on stratification and for how to pronounce it communi the communication yes this one uh, of these uh, educational systems and 
it's quite interesting that there is actually not, at least not very strong correlation between two, these two dimensions, that there is quite a lot of variation in commodification of education, but not so much actually in educational stratification, so that in countries like in Denmark and, and, and Finland, Sweden, and all and countries like USA, Japan and UK, they are at the same level of educational stratification. Can you some way comment this? Is it surprising to you or or is there some explanation that why this different, very different educational system still create the same quite similar educational stratification? Thanks, Kari. <clears throat> yes, uh, I think one easy answer is that um, uh, the x-axis is a little bit compressed and it's very dependent on how you operationalize it and it's of course criticisms <laughs> for Wusemeyer, my supervisor, <laughs> but I think he used, uh, he oper operationalized it based on survey and it survey uh, and he didn't standardize these um, these measures and that's why it might give you a little bit you know biased or 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 a little bit at least um, um, it's, it's 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 still objective but it given that the x-axis is a little bit compressed assuming it was based on Likert scale or something the survey so that, that's why it seems that these uh, these uh, these differences are not so huge uh, but but at, at the same time when we are talking about correlation which is uh, not so much dependent on how you measure so and not so much dependent on the scale of your measurement but rather whether these two goes together and yes and i think it's very interesting in, interesting and it goes back to my, my comparative work what i have done when i have been comparing educational governance of different countries and you obviously are also aware of this literature of decentralization in education and and whether this decentralization pays off and whether, whether public dominance always in a, a means more equitable results in education and and i think it's it's really intriguing to see that actually it it seems that at least in education it's much more dependent on design so how you take on board private providers and 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 i think uh, there are Jane Gingrich who have one very good uh, <laughs> book about that the varieties of markets in welfare state where she argues actually that uh, there are two very important um, aspects we have to take into account one is provisional who provides education whether it's private whether it's public but at the same time the second dimension to take on board also is who, uh, who controls the access whether it's individual responsibility or whether it's a collective responsibility state responsibility to uh, to to lower down these uh, barriers and i think it's it's really intriguing uh, and good example here this very easy scatterboard scatterplot uh, that actually this this uh, uh, governance of educational inequality needs more detailed or nuanced analysis. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Professor Jenkins. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, Sorry, yes. <laughs> <laughs> too long on too long on Zoom. Um, you Hello, I'm Stephen Jenkins mm -hmm. from the LSE. Th thanks for, very much for your interesting talk. Uh, I'd like to uh, step back a little and uh, ask a very general question, which brings us to the very last bullet points of your uh, presentation. Um, I noticed that the job is advertised as being a professor of social and population policy, but you have talked primarily about um, what social policy in particular, comparative social policy and education policy. Uh, could you just briefly explain what we, the extent to which you think um, 
population policy is relevant to you, relevant to your take on how you would take the job forward in future, were you to get it? Yeah, thank you. Very good question. I, I, uh, I, I acknowledge, I think even in my motivation letter, uh, <laughs> that, that I have been much more active in, in working uh, or in doing research in, in the fields of political science, sociology and, and policy analysis, perhaps also a little bit in, in social work. But yes, that's true that I haven't done much together with um, demographers and population study research, studies researchers. However, everything what I do <laughs> uh, and all problems in whether it be in social policy, comparative social policy are very much actually reliant on aging population. Uh, and all these social investment policies also, they are actually very much um, uh, dependent or, or, or influenced by, by, by the situation in, in, in the population. So whether it be aging, whether it, it is uh, uh, family policies, uh, so on and so forth. So I see very close connection, of course, between, uh, between population studies and what I do. Uh, whether in social policy in general, uh, talking about the carrying capacity of welfare sta states, whether we are talking about immigration or minorities, whether we are talking about family policy. So everything is very, very much dependent on what is going on in the wider uh, society, especially in terms of uh, <laughs> population. But I, I, I do admit that I'm not expert on population studies. So my, I'm, I'm, I'm more, I, I'm totally aware of the importance of the input from population studies into my work. Uh, but I'm not myself expert uh, in, 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 in the discipline of population studies. Okay, thank you very much. Actually, time is running out if someone has a very brief question. Five, I think. Yes, then we can take it. Okay, if I, uh, hello. Yeah, My very briefly Pudu. and a very okay. brief answer as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, very short uh, question. Uh, how do you see uh, the role of uh, the new professorship? Uh, like what is the mission, the main mission uh, regarding uh, creating research groups and uh, attracting research funds and that kind of perspective for you. Thank you. Yeah, this uh, interdisciplinarity is almost becoming a empty signifier, I think, in our university. So we are, from that regard, that we are talking very much about the interdisciplinarity and, and at the same time, personally, and, and all others have claimed that it's not so easy to do interdisciplinary research. Of course, my main uh, um, I, I'm, I believe that the most important starting point, given that university at the top level have acknowledged that social policy is interdisciplinary field, that interdisciplinarity is very important. So my personal understanding is that what we have to do next, we have to come down and bottom up we have to start to pay attention what others do because okay. it's really it's really not important to work together if you do not if you are not interested in others work and if you do not understand what others do and only then i see that uh, that we can do important things together in in social policy okay thank you very much